Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last lecture of guitar amplification and effects, we'd looked at the biasing of the push-pull output stage of the Marshall 18-watt amplifier. In this lecture, we'll compute how much power the amplifier can provide to the speaker. Once again, I would like to give credit to Pedal Monkey, who created this schematic. The push-pull output stage of the Marshall 18-watt amplifier is driven by a long-tailed pair. Zooming in a little bit, we see that the user can select between different taps on the transformer to select for different speaker impedances. And notice there's this interesting notation. I have 5, 7, and 3 ohms. But in parentheses, it looks like there's another version that had 16, 8, or 4 ohms. As I was going over my notes from 2019, which is the last time I taught this class, I came across this set of transformer data in my notes. And unfortunately, I have no idea where I got this from. And my Google foo is failing me. Presumably, I got it from somewhere and didn't just make it up. If these particular numbers look familiar to you, let me know. Let's go ahead and use them as nominal values. In particular, I'm going to do some computations for this 8 kilo ohm on the tube side, 15 ohm on the speaker side case. You can redo the analysis for these other pairs if you want. Overall, you'll get similar results. In any case, I computed the turns ratio for this, which is the square root of the reflected impedance over the speaker impedance as 23.1. That will come in handy later. Remember from the last lecture that our overall approach is to treat one half of the push-pull amplifier and taking half of the amplifier and splitting it into its DC bias and small signal circuits. Last time we looked at the biasing, and in this lecture we're going to perform a large signal analysis. In the last lecture we computed a grid to cathode bias voltage of minus 11 volts, a plate to cathode bias voltage of 314 volts, and a plate current of 44 milliamps. Although, as we'll see in a second, I'm going to fudge this number a little bit. So on the MOLED version of the EL84 datasheet, I found this plot of plate current versus plate to cathode voltage for a screen to cathode voltage of 300 volts. There is another plot for a screen to cathode voltage of 250 volt, but our screen to cathode voltage we looked at last time was something like 289 volt. So I figured that 300 is closer to that, so we would use this graph. So let me draw a line at 314 volt, and let me draw another line at 44 milliamp. And in theory, this would be my DC operating point. Something is a little awkward though. It looks like my operating point would have a grid to cathode voltage between minus 8 volt and 10 volt, definitely closer to the 10 volt side. But we computed a grid to cathode voltage of minus 11 volt. And let's see, if the spacing between these curves is consistent, that would probably put us a line somewhere down here somewhere. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just fudge this value a little bit. It felt a little high to me in the previous lecture anyway, so let me compromise by, say, changing that to 40 milliamp. If I draw a line at 40 milliamp, it's not quite down where I would imagine a minus 11 volt grid to cathode line might be, but it's closer to it. And it's also closer to that 12 watt power limit that here is indicated by this dashed line. So something that's interesting about this data sheet is that it actually shows these curves for situations beyond the safe operating limit of the tube as these dashed lines. This kind of region existed for things like the 12AX7, but that data sheet just didn't bother to plot anything out here at all. It just assumed you were smart enough not to go there. So this amplifier is biased to operate in a class AB mode where some of the time both tubes are operating and it's acting kind of like a combined class A amplifier. But at the extremes, it's operating like a class B amplifier where one of the tubes is on, but the other tube is completely shut off. So to get a handle on this, let me start by treating it as a class A amplifier, draw an AC load line, and see what we can find. 
All right, so let's plot a point on the horizontal axis. We can imagine marching down 40 milliamps. And as we're marching down, we march to the right according to Ohm's law based on the impedance we see reflected through the speaker. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the starting point of 314 volts and I'm going to add to it that 40 milliamps times 4 kilo ohm as seen reflected by the speaker. Wait a minute, you say. Lennerman, what's up with this 4K when earlier you said you were going to use an 8K reflected impedance? Well, that 8K figure is a plate-to-plate -plate impedance. So each individual tube only sees half of that. So that's why I'm using 4K instead of 8K. Don't worry, it gets more complicated. Anyway, I see that we will march 160 volts to the right, landing at 474 volt. So, now let me find a point on the vertical axis. I'm going to start at 40 milliamp. Now, I'm going to imagine that as I march 314 volts to the left, I'm going to climb up the vertical axis. So, I'm going to start at 40 milliamp, and I'm going to climb by 314 volts divided by 4 kilo ohm by Ohm's law. So I'm going to climb 78.5 milliamp, giving me 118.5 milliamp. I'm being a little pedantic with my significant digits here. And drawing a point on the horizontal axis at 474 volt and a point on the vertical axis at 118.5 milliamp, I get a line that looks like this purple line here. Notice that it passes through the DC operating point as well it should. If it doesn't, it means we did something wrong somewhere. So I can trace this purple line along and see where it intersects the grid to cathode equals zero volt line. That's our operating limit. And if I draw a line and find that, I'll call that to be something like 40 volt. So we can swing from 314 volt down to 40 volt, so my left swing limit is 274 volts. So assuming for the moment that I could really treat this as a class A amplifier, I'll come back to that point, how much voltage can I apply to the speaker? Well, remember that I have two tubes operating together, so I don't just get 274 volts. If I look at the transformer end to end, I actually have twice that because I have these two tubes working together. Now, if I were to divide that by the turns ratio, 23.1 I computed earlier, we're delivering 23.72 volts maximum to the speaker. And then to figure out the maximum power, I would square that and divide that by the impedance of the speaker, which is 15 ohm, giving me 37.5 watts. But that's peak. If we imagine putting in a sine wave and computing the RMS value, I need to divide that by 2, which gives me 18.25 watts. And that's nice because it matches the name of the amplifier. I didn't actually have to use the turns ratio to do this computation. I don't have to look at the max voltage on the speaker side, although I do it because I think it's instructive to do so. We know that power is conserved across the transformer, so I can do the same calculation on the tube side. So here I can just square that twice of the 274 directly and then divide that by the plate-to-plate -plate impedance. That gives me my 37.5, and dividing that by 2 gives me my 18.25. But that's not the whole story. I've assumed that this is somehow always magically operating as a Class A amplifier. Imagine you're not playing your guitar, so no signal is coming in, and your amp is happily sitting at this quiescent point. Okay, you start playing your guitar. Part of the waveform comes in, and one of the tubes is going this direction in the push-pull stage. It's a push-pull, and that means that the other tube stage is doing something like this. They're going in opposite directions, and... As the waveform keeps going and one tube keeps going this direction, the other one keeps going this direction, and eventually the waveform is hitting a point where this guy is pushing out here, and this one is going this direction, and oh no, it actually hits that current limit here at the bottom, and one of the tubes goes into cutoff, so one of the tubes can keep operating and keep pushing this direction, but the other tube is out of the picture.
So that's more class B style behavior. To get some intuition behind this, I'm going to do some analysis that's not really meaningful, but is kind of fun anyway. Let's imagine that we built this as a class B amplifier. So for a class B amplifier, one of the tubes is on, but the other tube is off. So for that, we actually set the bias current down here at zero. That means that class B amplifiers are very efficient because if you're not playing anything, the bias current is zero, so your tubes aren't using any power. A class A or a class AB mode always has some bias current flowing, which means that you're burning power even if you're not playing your guitar. So in a class B mode, one of the tubes is handling the positive going part of the input waveform, and the other tube is entirely responsible for the negative going part of the input waveform. Although it's very efficient, people avoid using a pure class B mode because the handoff between the tubes may not be very clean, so you can get this crossover distortion effect. Okay, so my bias point is now actually down here. It's at 314 volt, but zero milliamp. Now, what about a point on the vertical axis? Well, I'm going to march 314 volts this way. How far should I climb the vertical axis? That turns out to be 314 volts divided by 2 kilo ohm. Okay, where does that 2 kilo ohm come from? I started by saying that we had an 8 kilo ohm transformer, and then I said, well, in the class A mode, each of the tubes is only going to see 4K of that. Something even more complicated goes on here. So if one of these tubes goes into cutoff, essentially it's like you took this side of the transformer and just left it entirely disconnected. It's out of the circuit. So you only see half of the windings. And remember there's this square square root kind of relationship between the turns ratio and the impedance of the transformer. So the net effect is that by having half of the windings in play, you wind up dividing the impedance by four. I told you it was gonna get more confusing. So 8K divided by four gives me that 2K. So 314 volt divided by 2K gives me 157 milliamps, which is this point up here. Drawing a line connecting these, I can see where that AC load line for this imaginary class B mode intersects my grid to cathode equals zero volt line. And that's a little bit to the right of 50 volts. Just to have something, I'm gonna call it 52 volts. So I can swing to the left by 314 minus 52 volt or 262 volt. This time I don't multiply by two over here because only one of the tubes is in play. Now I divide that by the turns ratio but remember, we're only using half of the turns. So this 11.55 is half of this 23.1. So that gives me a theoretical max voltage at the speaker of 23.49 volts, being a little ridiculous with my significant digits. I'll take that, square it, divide it by the 15 ohms of the speaker. Remember this business about half of the windings being cut out, that's only happening on the tube side. The speaker is the speaker. Anyway, we take that 23.49 squared, divide it by 15, we get 36.8. That is a maximum power value. We would take that 36.8 watts, divide it by two to get an RMS value of 18.4 watts. So that's a convenient coincidence. So let me take my original class A load line with this bias point and superimpose our hypothetical class B amplifier load line on top of it. When you're not playing very hard, the amplifier is operating along this purple line in this class A region. But as you start to push things, this brown line up here that represents the class B kind of operation comes to dominate. So the overall behavior of this class AB circuit is not really defined by a load line. It's really more of a load curve consisting of this part of the brown line here and this part of the purple line here. Now, it's not like it's really piecewise linear. 
it sort of smoothly morphs between the brown line and the purple line in this transition stage. Oh, and just as a reminder of our earlier discussion about single-ended amplifiers, don't be freaked out by the fact that this can produce voltages at the plate that are bigger than the actual power supply that was 320 volt. Remember that the load provided by the speaker is a reactive load. It can store energy in a magnetic field and then spit it back at the amp. In any case, the various calculations I've done here can be somewhat described as hand-waving and writing numbers down and multiplying and dividing things until I get something close to the number 18. Accurately analyzing a push-pull amplifier requires that you create these things called composite curves as described here in the Radiotron Designer's Handbook. This is awfully complicated stuff. It's more complicated than I want to get in this class. It's more complicated than I ever want to get in my life. If you would like to learn more about this, I would highly recommend Richard Kono's books. Before we close out, one thing that I forgot to mention last time is that there's something nice about the transformers you can use for push-pull amplifiers. Because the bias currents for the different tubes are flowing opposite directions in the transformer, you don't need an air gap in here to prevent the core from saturating the way you do with a transformer for a single-ended amplifier. So that can potentially save cost on your transformer.